I'm Mike Perry, Executive Director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation, a support group for the U.S. Army Heritage Ed Education Center here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Tonight's speaker is no stranger to the U.S. Army Heritage uh, Center Foundation and no stranger to the archival collections here at the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center. Many times over the years, I've, I've seen him doing research uh, in our library. He is the military historian columnist, I should say Tom is the military historian columnist for the New York Times Book Review and a visiting fellow in history at Bowdoin College. Tom covers the US military for the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, where he has been a reporter for 17 years. He has received two Pulitzer Prizes as part of a reporting teams at those newspapers and was a finalist for his book, Fiasco, The American Military Adventure in Iraq. His other books of note include The Generals, American Military Command from World War II to Today, Church and Orwell, The Fight for Freedom, and The Gamble, General Petraeus and the American Military Adventure in Iraq. He has, he has now left the 20th century and turned to the periods of our nation's founding. Tonight he will discuss his latest book, First Principles, What American Founders Learned from the Greeks and Romans and How It Shaped Our Country. Please note the chat feature is turned off. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer tab on your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of talk's talk. Thank you, and now I'll turn the floor over to Tom Ricks. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a real pleasure, even virtually, to be back at the Army Heritage Center. Uh, as you say, I spent a lot of time in those archives. I, it's a place I love to do research, especially when some guy was pulling files for you, leans over and says, you know, Tom, you've been asking about this and this. I thought you might like to see this file too. And that really does help. Uh, just the pleasure of research there. I also want to begin with an apology. This is the first formal talk I've done over Zoom. Uh, so if it feels a bit awkward, you're right. It is a bit awkward. So I hope to forge through and I hope you stick with me, everybody. This book, First Principles, it surprised me with the reaction to it. It came out uh, just formally this morning, but it's been number two or number three on Amazon most of the day. There seems to be more interest out here than I had expected. I know I'm fascinated by these questions and by this era in American history. I hadn't realized quite how many other people there are out there. I began working on the book almost exactly four years ago. Um, on the first Tuesday in November, 2016, Donald Trump was elected president. I was shocked. I had not expected that at all. And the next morning was a gray morning here where I live in Maine. And I went down to my library and I said, what just happened? I don't understand. And so I think, I thought to myself, you know, whenever you have a fundamental question, go back to first principles, go back to the origins. So I took down Aristotle's politics off the shelf in my library and began reading it and reading about how his analysis of how political systems work. And that led me eventually to reading what the first four presidents read in ancient Greek and Roman literature and history. And I became really stunned by how steeped they were in the history and the literature of the Romans and to a lesser extent, the Greeks. Uh, this really is where their political vocabulary came from, how they thought about politics and the concerns they had. Um, how does a republic collapse as the Roman Republic collapsed? How do you keep a big republic alive? These were the questions that animated them and actually drove in large part the writing of the constitution that we still live by some 250 odd years later. The exception to the classicism of the founding fathers was George Washington. The irony of that is that he would become the most Roman of them all. He embodied to his peers and to the American public, great Roman figures. He tried at first to be the American Cato, a man of reservation of more deeds than words, stoical, quiet, careful, prudent, and ultimately trusted for his judgment. Later, during the American Revolution, he became the American Fabius, which I'll talk a lot about later, Fabius being a Roman general. Then at the end of the war, he turned over power. He didn't try to retain power, 
which shocked a lot of people. They had seen generals win independence in countries before or win a civil war and assume power. Instead, he became the American Cincinnatus, the legendary Roman figure who want, was called by his country from his farm, led the Romans into battle, won the fight, and went back to his waiting plow. There was one Roman figure he would not become, and this is the most, most credit I could give him of any of these figures. He did not become the American Caesar, the Julius Caesar, the general who seized power from the Republic. So who was this guy, George Washington? He was an unusual figure um, among his peers, among the people who wrote the Constitution, among the people who went to the first Congressional Congress, the Continental Congress. One of the most unusual ways was a way that really embarrassed him. Alone among our first four presidents, he was not a well-educated man, and he knew it. Early during the American Revolution, he told an aide-de-camp, I am conscious of a defective education. And boy, did the people around him make him conscious of it sometimes. He knew he was not classically educated. He did not read Greek or Latin or French or German. He did not have any language besides English. And he wasn't particularly well-read even in his own language. Unlike Adams and Jefferson, he never traveled to Europe. His ignorance was such that one night in Philadelphia in 1791, John Adams, the vice president, got into a heated argument with Timothy Pickering. Pickering was about to become the postmaster general, but knew Washington from the war. And Timothy Pickering told Adams that he thought that Washington, George Washington, General Washington, was close to illiterate, could hardly write, he said. Adams said, no, he said, I got his letters. I was in Congress during the war and I got the general's letters and they were very well written. No Pickering laughed back at him. Those were written by the, his staff, particularly the bright young one named Alexander Hamilton. And by the way, Alexander Hamilton, um, I have a real problems with him a lot in many ways. Uh, I think he was a little bit crazy in some ways, but one thing he was, was a great writer among the founders, the most energetic writer. Reading through the founders papers, you always recognize the energy and the clarity in Alexander Hamilton's prose. But to go back to the argument that Pickering and Adams were having, Adams said, okay, Washington may have not been a, the most literate of men, but he's a thoughtful man. And Thomas Jefferson, who had a lot of problems with Washington down the road, agreed with that assessment. He said, Washington is slow and steady, with sure judgment. Now, neither one of them, Adams or Jefferson, knew much about military affairs. And so they didn't see that Washington would learn the hard way to think slowly and to act with energy. Washington generally learned from experience rather than books. Uh, a phrase familiar to those of you who have served in the US Army, he was a man of deeds, not words. And I think this is something that's not appreciated by scholars. Academics are people of words, as are writers like me. He was not. He was a man of experience, observation, and reflection. And Washington learned a lot from experience, especially from defeat early in his life. He helped start the French and Indian War in the 1750s. And he was part of the British force that was out there fighting the French on the frontier in what is now Ohio. Pennsylvania. In 1754, he surrendered, the only time in his life that he surrendered, to a French force at Fort Necessity. The following year, 1755, young George Washington was part of the largest European military expedition ever seen on the North American continent. The British force, led by General Braddock, was about 1,200. A few miles southeast of where Pittsburgh is today, Braddock and his people were ambushed by a force of 700 Indians and 300 Frenchmen. So you have roughly equal forces, 1,200 British, 700 Indians, 300 Frenchmen. I will say Indians here 
rather than first peoples because it becomes awkward talking over Zoom. I prefer the term first peoples to either Indians or Na uh, Native Americans. Washington had assumed the French were poor fighters. He found out that day he was wrong, badly wrong. He also saw that the Indians were very effective fighters. They understood where the firepower was in the British force. They understood that it was important to get the artillery pieces to take them out of action. Artillery basically then played the role that a machine gun might in modern warfare, a flat trajectory, um, direct fire weapon to take out large numbers of infantry. On that day, the day of Braddock's defeat, two thirds of the British force was killed or wounded. That's an astonishing defeat. Washington had 20 years then to think about that defeat. And Washington then eventually goes into Virginia politics. And by the way, he is a politician before he's ever a general. And he's a politician after he's a general. He was a politician much longer than he was a general. But during those years, he had a lot of time to think about what happened that day in Braddock's defeat. And I think looking over the experience, very rough, difficult time, he probably distilled them into some general lessons along these lines. I see five basic lessons he might've taken away. One, know who you are fighting. Number two, study the terrain and make it your friend. He had a very good eye for terrain, by the way beginning his working life as a land surveyor. Three, as circumstances change, be ready to change yourself. Be ready to change your views. Be ready to abandon assumptions. And as part of that, listen to the dissenters, to the people who say you might be wrong and figure out how to weigh alternatives. Four, think slowly and act quickly. The opposite of what glib, clever political types like Adams and Jefferson and Madison might do. Most importantly is lesson number five. Washington had seen that he himself could recover from a stinging defeat, and perhaps also that the key, jo the key goal of a general sometimes is not to win a battle, but simply to keep the army alive. I think that was a crucial lesson for him not just for the command of his troops, but for the command of his self. He is a guy who lost more often than he won during the revolution, but he won because he understood that sometimes the important thing is to keep your army alive. Out of this experience, I think Washington became what today we would call a critical thinker. More than almost all of his peers, he became able to study a situation, evaluate its facts, decide which ones were important, develop a course of action in response to them uh, in order to work toward a desired outcome and to verbalize the orders that needed to be issued. And as I said, he knew he needed help with that last one, verbalization, and he kept an eye out for good writers who understood military operations. Those five lessons are all important ones. But they're all really more tactical than anything else. They're about how to fight. He still had to learn strategy. And I think that came in the first two years of his command of the United States Army, 1775, 1776. He did not begin well. In 1775, 1776, George Washington had a lot to learn, especially about strategy. He suffered a terrible series of setbacks in the second half of 1776. But, and this is the important but, he learned from those setbacks. Indeed, I think the best measure of a general is the ability to grasp the nature of the war in which he is engaged and then to make adjustments. Washington, by that measure, was one of the greatest generals this country has ever had. This is not perceived because, as I said, he had few victories. But it was not a war that was going to be won by battles. It was a different sort of conflict. It was not about simply taking the enemy's capital. It was not even about 
holding territory. It was about winning the support of the American people. To this end, George Washington slowly, reluctantly, and sometimes very unhappily, became a Fabian. I mentioned Fabius earlier. Fabius is the Roman general who defeated Hannibal by refusing to fight him. In the year 218 BC, when Hannibal led a force of Carthaginians and Spaniards and various Gaul tribes into Italy, he chased the Roman army around the Italian peninsula for 15 years, but he never could achieve a decisive victory. And eventually he packed up and went back to Carthage. Fabius won that war. Leading an indirect campaign of this sort was not an instinctive step for George Washington. He had to avoid battle, to wear out the enemy, to deprive them of supplies, of the support of civilians. Washington was a naturally aggressive leader. He was in inclined to be impatient. He had a volcanic temper that he had to struggle all his life to contain, and he struggled successfully most of the time. But like everyone else, generals are altered by the experience of war. And Washington was fortunate in that he was relatively young when he took top command. He was just 44 years old when he became the first soldier in the United States Army. More than most senior commanders, he was able to observe, reflect, and change. War puts extravagant pressures on people. And Washington, under these most extravagant pressures, this leader of a rebel nation fighting the world's greatest military power, Washington changed more than most generals do or can. I think there were three basic stages in Washington's evolution during the revolution. In 1775 and much of 1776, he was a conventional thinker. He was inclined to take the offensive even if he didn't have the troops for that. For example, in Boston, he wanted to launch a complex land and amphibious attack against British defenders entrenched on the Boston Neck. That was a difficult plan, even if you had seasoned troops, and he did not. He also was contemptuous of his militiamen, the part-time soldiers who were not the regulars. He thought them dirty, and I think also he was a little shocked by the rudeness of the New Englanders. They didn't defer to a man of wealth and standing, such as George Washington. They were kind of independent. In leading this army, he suffered a bunch of singing, st stinging setbacks, especially around New York City in the summer of 1776. He was kicked out of Long Island into Manhattan, and he was kicked out of Manhattan across the Hudson into New Jersey. As this is happening, he says, okay, offensive warfare isn't working for me. And he decides to shift what he called and what was called then a war of post, P-O-S-T-S. -S. This was an interim step. It was not Fabian yet. It was still oriented on battle. A war of post is one in which you retreat into a fortress and invite the enemy to bring the fight to you. You're entrenched they, and the traditional thinking is that entrenched forces have the advantage over the attacker. Unfortunately for George Washington and for the American army, his approach to the War of Post failed miserably. But Washington began to learn. He came to understand, I think during this time, that winning battles is not the same as winning wars. And I think this is a mistake you see a lot in academic historians who are not military specialists when in the course of say writing a biography, they write about conflict. They tend to focus much too much on battles and neglect other aspects of warfare, especially logistics. Focusing on battles is a mistake because battlefield victories are an uncertain measure of strategic advantage. For example, you can have a defeat, a tactical setback, that still produces a strategic advantage. If by engaging the enemy, you slow his movement, you distract him from other targets, or simply wear him down. For example, before Benedict Arnold went bad, um, he confronted the British in the Battle 
uh, Lake Champlain in October 1776. He lost, defeated thoroughly, but his loss brought strategic gain. It distracted the British, delayed them from settling in and taking upstate New York. And that brought the Americans time to get in place there. And a year later, in the same area, Saratoga, the Americans won the single most important battle of the war. Sometimes battles are important. Meanwhile, a couple hundred miles to the south, Washington was chased across New Jersey. He was failing miserable, miserably, and he knew it. Some of his subordinate commanders began to grumble that he was the wrong man to lead the American army. One commander, the, the commander of the very good uh, Delaware Regiment, told a friend in Congress exactly that, that Washington was a good guy, but probably not the best man to be the commanding general. And Washington began to kind of agree. In December 1776, he wrote in a private letter that he thought, and I quote, the game is pretty near up. He wasn't just talking about his time in command, he was beginning to think they had lost the war. In this low point, he was facing the reality that he had tried to fight the British in two different ways and that both had failed, offensive operations and the war of post. His army was shrinking. His senior subordinates doubted him. One of his aides wrote an extremely disloyal letter to another general telling the other general that he'd be better to lead the army. People were losing heart. And this is where I think Washington really showed himself to be a genius during this period. Uh, genius is a big word. Uh, and I would admit right out, he was an unusual one, a nonverbal genius, but I think nonetheless, a wonderful commander. It's a cliche and a bad one, the generals fight the last war. That doesn't give them enough credit. Rather, they tend to fight the war they would like to fight or the one they expected to fight. But often, neither of those responses is adequate. Clausewitz tells us the foremost task of the general is to understand the nature of the war he faces. And that generally turns out to be a third way, not the one wanted, not the one expected. This sort of discernment, what is the war I'm fighting, is especially difficult at that foggy, uncertain, unpredictable first year of a war. Washington, to his everlasting credit and to our good fortune as a nation, he tried, he made mistakes, and he observed and reflected, and he learned, and that last word made all the difference. His strategy evolved in late 1776 and early 1777. During this period, Washington learned better how to use his soldiers. Yes, if you put militiamen up against British regulars, they would fight and run in set piece battles, especially when they were hit in the open by volleys from well-trained British troops, sometimes followed by a terrifying bayonet charge. Yet concluding that militiamen were bad because they could not face big battles was like criticizing for a saw for not being a hammer. You use a hammer for one thing, you use a saw for another thing. What Washington had to learn was what's, which of his soldiers, which of his units were hammers, which were saws, and which were other tools. He learned that militiamen could be militarily effective when used in a manner that played to their strengths. Let them fight near their own towns, amid familiar fields and hills. They would prove far more resilient. Encourage them to take on isolated British patrols. And when the situation was quiet and allowed it, let them slip home to tend to their farms where they also would police the locals, maybe round, prevent people from going over to the British and they would gather intelligence. This was not a recipe for conventional military glory, but it did point the way toward a way of possibly defeating the British. Battles happen only occasionally. Armies eat every day. Militiamen turned out to be most effective when they were nibbling away at British supply convoys or at foraging parties, out looking for food for a hungry army in the wintertime. One of the tricks that the New Jersey militia used was to put out a herd of cattle. And then when the British heard of this herd and came to get it, ambush them. And for much of the time in any given day, that was the real war. 
skirmishes with isolated British units. And it was surprisingly successful. Eventually, the British simply stopped trying to forage in New Jersey and had their supplies shipped in from New York City, usually from growing in Long Island or elsewhere. The British lost a lot of troops. When they kicked the American army out of New York City in September 1776, they had 31,000 effective soldiers. By February of 1777, hardly six months later, the British in, cent in the central part of the United States had 14,000. More than half of them were gone, killed, badly wounded, captured, seriously ill, or deserted. In five months, they lost half their forces in the middle colonies. This brings us back to that young West Indian, Alexander Hamilton. In March of 1777, he joined Washington's staff. Part of his new job was to go on missions to explain war plans to subordinate commanders. And he was very good at summarizing what Washington was trying to do. I'll quote him here. Alexander Hamilton writes, the liberties of America are an infinite stake. We should not play a desperate game for it or put it upon the issue of a single cast of the die. The loss of one general engagement may effectively ruin us and it would certainly be folly to hazard it. Our business then is to avoid a general engagement and waste the enemy away by constantly goading their, side, their sides in a desultory, teasing way. As that shows, Hamilton summarizing Washington's view of the path to victory, Washington was now both an adherent and an advocate of a modified Fabian approach. Yes, he would attack at times of opportunity, but he would not seek to decide the war through big battles. That is, his goal is keep the American army intact, move away from the coast when necessary because the British Navy is out there, rally the people, intimidate those who were loyal to the British, keep it going, and eventually you might win. He didn't have to have victory, he simply had to be, not be defeated. Excuse me. The key is he adjusted, he changed. The British did not. British commanders basically fought a very conventional European style of war. Looking back a couple of, from the perspective of a couple of centuries, it makes sense, this Fabian approach. There is a real parallel between what Fabian was doing with Hannibal and what Washington did with the British. Hannibal was an invader from overseas who had to cross land and sea barriers to bring in additional supplies and troops, like the British. They were coming from overseas, they had a very long supply line, and they had not many additional troops available. After the war, the British Parliament held hearings on how they happened to lose this war, and they called before them General Howe. He told them in part, quote, that the most essential duty I had was not to wantonly to commit his majesty's troops where the object was inadequate. I knew well that any considerable loss sustained by the army could not be speedily or easily repaired. And as a modified Fabian, Washington knew that there were also times when he had to give battle. He did so mainly for political reasons, to show the people he was willing to fight or to rally the militias, hence, the battles of Brandywine and Germantown around Philadelphia. But by this point in late 1777, I began, I think he began to feel also the time was on his side, especially after Saratoga. Saratoga uh, gets the French to come in openly to back the Americans, the ships, money, troops. And he simply starts to bide his time. He doesn't fight that many battles at all after that. Even now, I think American historians, especially academic historians, fail to appreciate how much Washington changed during the war and how important that change was to bring about an American victory. You can see this, especially in the treatment of the Battle of Monmouth, uh, his last big battle in the North in the summer of 1778. Historians write about that one a lot. It was that last big Northern battle. 
but they almost never write about an event that happened just before Monmouth, something I consider far more significant to the outcome of the war. Just before Monmouth, the British gave up their occupation of, of Philadelphia. And in fact, they were on their way marching to ships on the Jer Jersey coast that would take them up to New York City. They were trying to withdraw from the American capital. Think about that. This was a war for the allegiance of the people. The British had rallied people to them in Philadelphia. They'd encouraged loyalists to come out to their side, to sign oaths, to give them intelligence. And then they had abandoned them. Think of the message that sent across the colonies, the newly independent states. The British identified their friends and everybody could see it. And then they left them. I think with the abandonment of Philadelphia, the British cause was doomed. Every American watching knew that you couldn't count on the British to be around to support you. And you better find ways to live with this new country in this new United States, even if you would rather have stayed under British rule. And that I think comes down to the bottom line. Washington understood his war, the British didn't, and that made all the difference. That concludes my prepared remarks. Now I'd love to get into your questions. Uh, I've only got one request, don't be too polite. Before I became a full-time book writer, I was a reporter for 30 years. I've got very thick skin. So if I can, um, if I can take it from Donald Rumsfeld, I can take it from you. So fire away, please. Well, we got uh, the first question is from Brooks. Uh, he said at Valley Forge, George Washington constantly focused on cleanliness of huts and disposal of refuse. A former professor explained he learned during the Seven Year Wars the importance of keeping the army healthy. Uh, would you care to comment? Yeah, uh, there's no question that he thought about that a lot. Uh, he himself had had smallpox as a young man on his sole trip out of the country into the West Indies. So he was lucky. Um, it was a mild case of smallpox, but smallpox was a major killer uh, of armies. And he paid a lot of attention to that, to cleanliness generally. Uh, even so, uh, his army at times was not well fed and was cold and, and hungry. Now, the more you study the revolution, the more it strikes me is that, especially in its first three years, it was a very near run thing. Um, someone who does not wish to be named at this time says, do you have any recommended books about Cincinnatus? No, I don't think there is a good book about Cincinnatus because there's very little known about him. He, he really is a remote Roman figure of myth and legend. Um, I'm no expert on him, but I have sat for hours trying to figure out more about Cincinnatus and it's not really there. Um, Fabius, by contrast, there are actually several good books. I remember one idle moment in Iraq. I think it was, I was somehow, I was talking to General Mattis and I, and I said, um, can you recommend a good book on, on, uh, on Hannibal? He said, well, what aspect of Hannibal do you want to know about? Which is a great response. And I said, well, I, I'm interested in them tactically. And he recommended a couple of books and I went and read them when I got back to the United States. Uh, this question is from Jeff, uh, who, who wants you to talk a little bit about Yorktown. Uh, it would appear that uh, this is a great gamble on the part of Washington. Do you think he preserved that he needed to take it as he had great dissension in the army and was unsure about the French? I don't see the gamble in Yorktown. I see it as Washington saying, at last I can abandon this Fabian stuff, which I've never really liked, and I can go back to conventional warfare. I have a French fleet offshore, bottling up the British. The British army, instead of just knocking me around, is constantly looking over their sh shoulder, wondering where the French fleet is. Uh, and he, he had French money and he had French troops. And he seems to have a dandy time. He goes into Williamsburg, I remember, and kind of has a party. The first night he's there as they're preparing the siege of Yorktown. Uh, they take over the College of William and Mary. They turn into a big hospital for the French. Uh, I think he really kind of enjoyed himself in a lot of ways at Yorktown. They knew, I think, that they were going to win that thing, and they won it handily. Uh, 
Uh, this question comes from Joe. Is it, is it fair to classify Washington's tactics as guerrilla warfare or is that an oversimplification? I would call that an oversimplification for a couple of reasons. First, Washington did have a regular force, but as a regular force supported, greatly supported by militias. This is actually something that I think is really one of the least appreciated aspects of the revolution. He commands the regular force, which gets quite small at one point. There was a young lieutenant, James Monroe, later became president, who one day counted the entire, Washington's entire army as it went by, by him. He was, he was keeping a record. And I think that day was something like 2,800 people. You know, that's not even a brigade in today's, today's army. Um, so it gets really small, but it's kind of, people are coming and going, they're going back to take care of their farms, they're coming out, and the militias, when you're in their area, um, when the British try to go in there are nibbling away at them, and Washington becomes a real uh, appreci uh, appreciative general looking at the militia. At one point, somebody says to him, why don't we bring all our forces together and have a big battle? And he said, that would be a most unsatisfactory approach. I want to keep the militias out there, nibbling at the enemy's rear, constantly making them wonder and look back about who was out there. Okay. This next question comes from Daniel. Uh, the title, your title refers to how the founding fathers learned from both the Romans and the Greeks, but in your talk, you focus mostly on the Romans. Do you have an example how the founding fathers were impacted by the Greeks, specifically Thucydides? Thucydides, I think, looms much larger today than he actually did back then. Generally, the founding fathers, that generation, the revolutionary generation, uh, had a very different view of the ancient world than we do today. First and foremost, Rome was huge for them. And the Greeks were kind of off in the background. Uh, when they did look at Greece, they tended to look at Sparta more than they looked to Athens. Samuel Adams, for example, uh, said his ambition for Boston was to make it a modern Sparta. Uh, Athens was seen as kind of too democratic, noisy, confused, famously called by one ancient historian a ship without a rudder, or a, I think maybe a ship without a captain. Uh, the exception here, by the way, is Thomas Jefferson, the only one of the first four presidents who I think was more Greek than Roman. Jefferson is a huge fan of Epicurus, and I think the Declaration of Independence is very informed by Epicurean thought, the pursuit of happiness. Um, just their whole ancient world is different. They're, they're very focused on the collapse of the Roman Republic, on Cato, Cicero, and Caesar, the major figures of that era. But even the literature for them is different. They don't much read, they don't much read the ancient Greek dramatists that we now think of the of greats of, the, of world literature. The exception here again is Jefferson, uh, who was fond of Euripides. Uh, and also they tended, they read Xenophon a lot. They like Xenophon's portrayal of Socrates. And that, so that was popular. But for example, the most popular dramatist from the ancient world who was read by the revolutionary generation was Terence, Terence being a Roman playwright, uh, who I confess, I did not read even for this book. Um, I tried. There are some things that are unreadable and I found Terence unreadable. Uh, this question is from Ed. He indicates Fabian tactics would only seem to have worked with the approval of Congress. Uh, could you expand on Washington's relationship with that body? Washington handled Congress marvelously. He was determined from the outset to be subordinate to them. And remember, they're fighting uh, just a century and more, to be 120 years after the English Civil War. Everybody knew that in the English Civil War, Cromwell uh, prevails against the king and then basically becomes a king himself. He becomes the, the dictator of the English Commonwealth and passes power to his son. Uh, so Washington doesn't want to go down that road. He wants to be subordinate to civilian authority. And it's pretty tough because Congress is a real pain. And I got to single out here John Adams, uh, who was important on defense matters in Congress. Adams, I don't know why, but John Adams thought he was a military expert. He hated the Fabian strategy. 
He constantly wanted, let's have one big battle. He wrote to his wife that everybody's talking about a long and careful and distant war. I say, hooey, it's time we had a big fight. Uh, he also said, the one thing we don't want is to let the French get involved. We need to fight this war by ourselves. Basically, again and again, John Adams is wrong. Um, Washington is careful, though, to explain himself to John Hancock, the president of the, of the Congress, um, to write a lot of letters and to maintain ties to people in Congress. This all comes to a head at the very end of the war. 1783, the American army is sitting in Newburgh, Newburgh New York, uh, north of New York City, a bit up the Hudson Valley. And they're basically waiting for the peace treaty to come through and then to go into New York after the British evacuate. A lot of officers are upset. They haven't been paid. A lot of American civilians get rich during the war, but the officers did not. And uh, they, there's this talk of mutiny that we should tell the American people we're not going to stand for it and we're going to take over or we're going to go form our own country or something like that. It's kind of vague. And Washington vigorously puts this down with a sneer. He says, basically, has not my personal example been enough? Have I not? stayed with this army throughout the war. I have grown old in the service of this country. I can barely see anymore without, without glasses. What, from my personal example, is lacking that would lead you people to behave this way? And he puts down the, the sort of talk of mutiny with that. An interesting thing I write about in the book, by the way, is I see the hand of Alexander Hamilton behind that mutiny. He was in Congress at the time, and he wanted to forced Congress to be more serious about raising money. And he thought that having the army uh, agitate for its pay would be the way to do it. And at the end of all of this, Washington writes a letter to Hamilton that says, it's a very dangerous thing to toy with an army. Now, this question comes from Alexander. He says, during the war against the French, Washington was involved in a rather significant friendly fire incident in Fort Ligonier, Pennsylvania. Do you see any indication that his memory of this event impacted on his self-confidence or how he functioned later? I don't know. I, I think he learned a lot. We, I know he learned a lot from the French and Indian War. He certainly changed his estimation of the French as fighters. Um, he really came to appreciate the importance of gathering intelligence. He saw that the French were much better uh, in using Indian scouts than the, than the British were, that a European force operating on the North American soil without Indian scouts was basically a blind force. But Washington, I think, throughout all this, had self-confidence. Uh, I think what he didn't have was the respect of the British, and that antagonized him deeply. And he ended the war, um, really, I he ended the French and Indian War, uh, really rather put out with a lack of honor and respect given him, including the fact that he'd wanted a British commission and was never given one. The next question is about the French and Rochambeau. Shouldn't they get much more credit for a Yorktown than they're given quite often? Yes, I'd agree with that. I, I think Yorktown only happened because the French were there. And if I recall correctly, I think there might have been more French troops at Yorktown than American. Um, the locals liked the French too because the French paid uh, in hard cash, you know, in, in coins, uh, gold and silver, whereas the Americans paid in continental dollars, uh, which were hard and depreciated greatly. They were hard to pass off sometimes. Uh, but yes, the, the French were hugely important. And it's interesting, at the end of the war, Washington is kind of considering what he's going to do with his life now. And uh, he invites, he, he's, he, he's in, contemplates a trip around the entire new United States. He wants to go up to, ride up into New England, then take boats across the Great Lakes, then ride to the Mississippi, come down the whole way across the Mississippi, and then up through the Southern states. And he invites a Frenchman, Lafayette, to join him. Uh, as it happens, he, he never gets around to it. But uh, he had developed a real affection for the French. Also remember, for all his talk, all the talk of him being illiterate, uneducated, Washington negotiated with the French long before John Adams or Thomas Jefferson ever did. He was out talking to the French before the French and Indian War in what is now Northwest Pennsylvania. 
And he was watching and talking to the First Peoples, what he used to call the Indian tribes. This question is from Shannon. How did the surprise Christmas assault against Trenton play into George Washington's evolution as a commander during the war? I get into this in the, in the book quite a lot because it was such a turning point. Now, the best book on the subject is Washington's Crossing by David Hackett Fisher, who writes a whole book about what happened there and why. I do a couple of pages on it. But basically, he had to fight. Uh, he had to send a signal. This is the point at which he was thinking the war might be lost. Uh, he needed a victory for political reasons, and he needed a victory for recruiting reasons. We tend to forget with our large formal force generation process in the 20th, 21st centuries, uh, one reason to fight a battle is to get new recruits to come in. And that's one thing that Trenton and Princeton uh, were about, which was getting people to say, you know, I actually might join this army or I might go back to the army after being out of my farm. And it worked. Uh, Congress was so happy with Trenton that it took the letter he wrote to Congress describing the battle and had it published. This question comes from, from Joseph. It's more uh, focused on today. He says, what practical lessons can today's senior leaders, senior officers learn from Washington's experience? I think the first thing to learn is that Washington was a learning general. He adapted, he studied what was happening he looked at himself self-critically and he adjusted. And I gotta tell you, in covering the war in Iraq, that did not happen, I think, for the first three or four years in the war. It happened in some divisions, but it didn't happen theater-wide uh, until the surge under General Petraeus in what, it was the uh, spring of 2000, I'm losing, yeah, it was the spring of 2007, January, February 2007 through August of that year, really. Uh, and that's a long time to fight, three or four years, without stepping back, reconsidering what you're doing, finding a better way to do it. Um, in fact, in my book, The Gamble, I published the, as an appendix uh, the orders laid down by General Casey at the end of 2006, and then the orders laid down by General Petraeus a few months later. And they're sharply different how we're going to fight, where we're going to fight, what our posture is going to be. Uh, and that's a huge shift. So I think what we need is more generals uh, to seriously study situations critically and to be ready to adjust. And remember also that you have a learning enemy. So tactics that work today aren't going to necessarily work tomorrow. Everybody knows this at the most basic level. If you keep patrolling the same patterns, eventually you're going to get whacked or blown up. Uh, but that's also true at a much, much higher levels, that your entire operations, your entire conceptions need to constantly be examined for their effectiveness and for their vulnerabilities. This is almost a follow-up, and you answered it partly. And this is from Doug. You said that based on your other books like Fiasco, uh, Talk a little bit about the British commanders, Howe and Clinton, and the American commanders, you know, but, but bring in what Howe and Clinton did and, and our American commanders did in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm not sure I heard the last part of that, Howe and Clinton in Afghanistan. How um, Clinton and Howe, and compare them to some of our senior leaders in Iraq and Afghanistan. The first parallel that immediately comes to mind is, the, is just the list of British generals. They come and go. Howe, Clinton, Cornwallis. Um, nobody is really committed to winning this fight in the way the Americans are. The Americans have got nowhere to go. Um, Washington hopes that if he loses, he might be able to escape out to the Ohio country and live there. But he, he writes privately in a letter about that. But they basically knew uh, if you lose, you're probably going to wind up being executed. In fact, at the Declaration of Independence, uh, jokes were made because Elbridge uh, Jerry uh, um, was rather large and fat. And somebody turned to him and said, uh, you're lucky when they hang all of us, you're going to go fast because your body will pull you down. But I'm small and thin. I'm going to dangle for an hour. They really knew. Uh, they had put their lives and their honor 
on the line, as they say at the end of the Declaration of Independence. So uh, they, had huge, they had huge incentives to adjust in a way the British didn't. The British kind of came and went. And that does remind me a lot of Afghanistan. Uh, it, 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 there's a lack of clarity. What are you doing? How are you trying to do it? The basic strategic questions in what we've been doing in Afghanistan. Uh, this question is from Kevin and it focuses on Baron von Steuben and his impact on Washington. Would you care to discuss and then maybe recommend a, a good biography or book on Steuben? I have not uh, focused on him much. I have not seen a, a good book on him. Um, what I'm, I, I was chuckling because the literature about, about him seems to focus these days on whether he was gay or not. Um, I don't know. Um, but that seemed to be the gossip around, around the camps. Clearly, uh, he was very good at drilling troops and instilling a, a, a sense of cohesion and it, through, through this drilling. Um, I can't really see a connection, though, between him and the themes of my book, and so I didn't really focus on them. Uh, this question talks about, uh, is from Robert, and talks about uh, Washington as a leader, and how, how did he become effective in keeping the Continental Army together, though poorly paid and poorly fed? I'm not sure he was that effective. It was a, manpower was a constant problem. People were constantly dribbling away. Officers were coming all upset. Their honor had been insulted somehow. Uh, and he, he had a troublesome set of generals. He was not well served uh, by Horatio Gates and by uh, why I'm on blanking out Charles, the British guy gets captured, um, another, another screwy general. And um, most of all, Benedict Arnold, uh, a very tactically effective commander who for some reason soured and, and turns. And I would kind of wonder to what degree Washington isn't better at seeing this, at discerning um, the evolution of Benedict Arnold. Why does he turn, turn like that? Um, I think Washington was mortified, I think the term he used, uh, at, at Benedict's treason. But you've got to wonder why he wasn't more suspicious, why he didn't see more why he didn't act more on it. Uh, this question also ties to, to leadership and leader development. Uh, this is from Charles. Uh, how did or did Washington develop his generals and leaders? Or was he as a forgiving with their losses and failures as he learned for himself? He did. It's, that's a good question because the flip side is you do see leaders develop. Um, Nathaniel Green would be the best example. A Quaker out of Rhode Island who I think ultimately becomes um, perhaps the best general of the entire war, including Washington. Um, and he, he does seem to have a good eye for which commanders could move up, especially later, later in the war, um, who to trust with. Um, Green being the best example. Um, and a couple of others, um, Daniel Morgan, um, who, who develop and, and fight innovatively. And I go back to the hammer and the saw are able to figure out which of their units are hammers, which are saws, which are screwdrivers, and to use them appropriately uh, to play to their strengths and to, as much as possible, compensate for their vulnerabilities. Tom, would you like to make some concluding remarks uh, at this time? Uh, only that, first of all, I've really enjoyed this session. It's been a long day, but uh, there's something about the people that the Army Heritage Center attracts that always makes these discussions interesting. I feel like we're almost inside the tent talking to each other about stuff we consider really important. The second thing is just a, something that's occurred to me um, in the last two days. I've been really surprised by how popular this book is turning out to be. Um, as I've been stunned to look at Amazon and see it number three of all books. Um, and there's not a lot of military history out there that's in the top 100, top, top 200. So that's been a really pleasant surprise to me that people wanna know uh, what was this country our founders designed and how did, what does it tell us about this country we still live in? We live in a house they designed. And some of the problems you're seeing right now in the headlines, um, electoral votes, things like that, date back to the decisions these people made 
as they design this country. And just one final thought. The reason that each state has two senators, whether it's tiny Wyoming or huge California with 50 times the number of voters, goes back to James Madison's study for several years before the constitution of ancient republics, especially ancient Greek republics and how they worked with each other and the confederations and the leagues they had. And the one that he liked most, uh, whether you were a big city state or a small city state, every member in the league had two votes. And they said, ultimately say that's the way the US Senate should be. And of course, your electoral votes are based upon having two senators plus the number of representatives you have in the House of Representatives. So Wyoming with 500,000 people has three electoral votes and California with 50 million has 35. Um, it's screwy, but that's the way they designed it. Thank you very much.